Okay, today's Torah portion is what? It is Nitzavim, which means standing. But here's the thing. It's not standing like you're slouching or people just standing around. No, it's everyone standing like in a military formation uh, with full attention. How many of you have know, uh, ever talked to your spouse or someone and you felt like they weren't paying attention? <laughs> okay, this is everyone is at attention and they're focused. But before we go there, I want to bring something up along this. Actually, today is a double Torah portion, and it's Avim Vayalek, and Vayalek means, and he went. But Exodus 7, 7, it says, Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. All right. Moses was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. Then he was 40 years in the wilderness on his own. He's 80 years old when he appears before Pharaoh. And Aaron, his older brother, is three years older. So how old was Moses? 80 years old. Now, look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3. It came to pass in the 40th Year. This is the 40 years of wandering. 40 years have gone by. And it's in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses speaks to the children of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in commandment to them. Okay, who knows the name of the 11th month in the Bible? Everyone, anyone remember? Anyone know the, remember the biblical calendar, what the 11th month is? It's the month of Shavuot. Shavat. All right, but here we go. I wanted you to see Moses is about to die. This is at the end of the 40th years of wandering. Okay, and then look at the end of the Torah. Deuteronomy 31, 1 and 2. This is Moses' final speech. And Moses went and he told, spoke these words to all of Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old this day. Okay, how old was he when he spoke to Pharaoh? How many years were they in the wilderness? And was 80 plus 40? 120. Okay, everyone's following this. Okay, when he says, I am 120 years old this day, what day was it? His? For obviously. He said, it's his birthday. When on the biblical calendar was his birthday? The seventh of Adar. Now, does it? Someone will say, well, it doesn't say it was the seventh of a dar in the Bible. Well, yes, it does, but you uh, have to figure it out, okay? And I'm going to show you how you can figure this out so you can prove to everybody he was born on the seventh of a dar. Now, just in case you want to know, his birthday next year is March 7th. So it happens it's a seven. So March 7th of 2025 is the day Moses was born and the day that he died. Okay. And look at Deuteronomy 34, 7. Moses was how old when he died? Right there. And uh, he could still see real good. Uh, He still had his strength. And it says the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for how many days? 30 days. That's one month. Okay. So here we go. Here is Moses standing before Pharaoh, and they're leaving. And it was Adar 7. And guess what? Adar 7 was Moses' birthday, but it also was the very day he died. Now, I'm going to give you the exact dates that this was. I have here lies Moses, 120 years old. He was born on Adar 7 in the year 2373 from Adam. He died 120 years later on Adar 7 in the year 2493 from Adam. Those are the exact years from Adam. I'm not going, I I can do that, but that, that freaks people out. But anyway, right here, this is the proof. Now, here's the Jewish months. And I have... a. On the, 
Tishri is the first month on the civil calendar. Nisan is the first month on the religious calendar. And so I have Nisan like up at midnight there. That's the first month. All right. So here we go. Nisan is one. The second month is Er. Now we know Nisan is Passover. Er is the counting of the Omer going to Shavuot, which is in Savan. The fourth month is Tammuz, when they worshiped the golden calf. The fifth month is Av, when the spies gave the bad report. The sixth month is where we are right now. It's the month of Elul, the month of repentance, which brings us to the seventh month, which is Tishri. It's the seventh month on the religious calendar, but the first month on the civil calendar. And this is when we have the fall feast. Then comes the eighth month, which is Heshvan, which is when the flood took place. Noah's flood. Okay. And then comes Tavet. That's the ninth month. The 10th month is the month of Tavet, and I believe it's Ezekiel 24, 1, where God said to Ezekiel, you write down the name of this day, don't you ever forget it, for this is the very day Nebuchadnezzar surrounded Jerusalem. So all these months have great significant uh, events. Then comes the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat. And it is on the very first day of Shabbat the 11th month that the book of Deuteronomy was being written. Okay, that's what it says. It was in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, and I'm just trying to help you guys get a good picture of all that is going on there. Uh, and Shavat, that is uh, the anniversary for trees. Tuba Shavat. Okay, remember Tuba Shavat? That, this is uh, when the trees are counted. You can eat of the fruit. Then comes Adar, the 12th month, and those are the symbols for Purim. This is when uh, Esther events took place. Haman wanted to kill all of the Jews. So I'm going through the calendar for you and some of the events. Now, the 7th of Adar, that is the day Moses was born. That is the day Moses dies. Okay? Now... How long did they mourn? Adar 7 to Nisan 7 is 30 days. You following me? This is how we prove he was born and died on the 7th of Adar. Because they mourned for him for 30 days, taking us to the 7th of Nisan. And we know Passover is on the 14th of Nisan. So let me give it to you this way. Here we have Moses. On the first day of Shavuot, he begins to speak the book of Deuteronomy. Now notice this is Thursday. We're about to go into the next month. So I'm going to put it up here again, but go to the next month. So here he is on the first of Shavuot. And he speaks for 30 days, going all the way through Shavuot until we come to Adar 7, which is not only his birthday, but the day that he dies as well. And then we see they mourn for 30 days, okay? And so here they are mourning. <clears throat> and so then what do we find? Uh, this brings us let me see, all the way over to here, which is the 7th of Nisan, okay? 7th of Dar, the 7th of Nisan. And then what's fascinating, what do we see here? Look at Joshua 1, 10, and 11 on your notes. It says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the host, command the people, prepare you victuals for within three days. We're going to pass over Jordan. Okay, so they fasted from Adar 7 to Nisan 7, and then they say, in three days, we're going to pass over the Jordan. Okay, and then look at Joshua 4, 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. Why? Because 7 plus 3 is 10. So right here, we see 
And it was the same day, 40 years earlier, that they had to get the lamb on the 10th of Nisan. 40 years later, it's the same day they crossed the Jordan with the ark. And so we see he had to be born on Adar 7 because it was the 7th of Nisan. God tells Joshua, stop morning. He's dead, guys. Okay. So he says, three days later, we're going to cross the Jordan. And they cross on the 10th. So if they cross on the 10th and it was three days, everything just points. You can figure this out when uh, you look at the details. But here's something else. I'm going to go back now. I want to show you something that is kind of interesting. Let me get rid of these here. Uh, let me get rid of that one. Okay. Now, let's look at this 40 years earlier. If I were to ask you, how long did the plagues last? All those plagues. Some people think it was a year. Some think it was a year and a half. Or How long do you think it actually was? All the plagues lasted about five weeks. And I'm going to prove it to you. And this is why you want to get understand timelines. This is how you can prove the plagues only lasted five weeks. How old was Moses when he appeared before Pharaoh? So it was his birthday. He was eight years old. It was his birthday. And for the fun of his birthday, he gets to go give gifts to Pharaoh. And they turn the water to blood. Then comes the frogs then the lice, uh, then the uh, locusts, and then the cattle die, and then the hail, okay? Uh, or there's the locusts, that was flies, all right? So anyway, all of this started on the seventh of Adar, and it, now we're just going through these. Then you have the first of Nisan, when it's a new moon and it's dark, that begins the three days of darkness, then they collect all of the funds when it's daylight. And then the 10th of Nisan, they grab their lamb. And then they have Passover and they're gone. And it all had to take place in five weeks because if he is 80, this means when they were in Egypt for 40 years or in the wilderness for 40 years, that included the times of the plagues. It's not after the plagues to get in the wilderness and then it's 40 years. No, the 40 years began when he appeared to Pharaoh. Why is that? He was 80 years old. How long were they in the wilderness? And he was 120 years old when he died. Everything had to happen within that time frame. <clears throat> if, if, he was, if the plagues went longer, he'd have been 121, not 120 when he died. And for him to be exactly 40 years, the place couldn't have began a year and a half earlier or he wouldn't have been 80. He'd have been 79. For him to be 80, he had to have had his 80th birthday. You following me? And we know they left on Passover, which is about five weeks after he was born. So anyway, that makes it kind of simple. I hope you got that. All right, now we're going to jump into the Torah portion itself. And so, uh, let's see here. Deuteronomy 29, 10 through 15. It says, you are all standing here today. Today is a very important word. Even in Hebrew, it quotes this about today. All of you are standing before the Lord your God. Uh, your captains, your elders, officers, the men, the little one, the wives, even the stranger that is in your camp from the cutter of your wood to the drawer of your water. In other words, that meant everybody, Jew and non-Jew, even the, uh, all the strangers that left the mixed multitude. And guess what? Even the mixed multitude is entering into this covenant. That's important to realize. <clears throat> and it says, uh, into the covenant with the Lord your God, into his oath, which the Lord your God makes you today, that he may establish you today for a people to himself, that he can be a God to you as he has said and as he has sworn to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now look at this. This is the most mind-blowing. Nor do I make this covenant and this oath with you only, but also with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God and also with him that is not here with us today. 
How many of you were with them there? No. But how many of you were not with them there? So it includes you because you weren't there. This is a thing. Everybody throughout history. You know, one of the interesting things, how many of you ever were in the military? How many of you uh, had to do what you were told? <laughs> I think everybody understands uh, what I'm talking about here. Well, the thing is this. It is the very day that every citizen becomes a soldier in God's army. Do we want to enlist in God's army? If you enlist in the army, you're saying, I will do what I'm told. If we are a soldier in God's army, we better do what we are told. Pretty simple. And uh, basically, the soldier agrees to do all that he's ordered without question, right? So why, off, why so often do Christians who believe they're in the God's army question everything he says? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, further, this enlistment in the army gives you a mission mentality. We've got to fulfill the mission. It awakens the soldier to turn his attention away from himself and toward the mission. Yet too many believers today are focused on their mission, not his mission. And so the true soldier no longer considers himself the focal point of his reality. His main desire is that the king's mission be accomplished, even if, if uh, he's not the one to carry it out. Let's get it done. Well, here we are in the Hebrew month of a lull, and the way we relate to God is as a child to his father. Okay, the theme of this month is returning home like the prodigal son story. That's what is so important. So in a lull, we return to God after a lengthy period in which we have been a soldier who deserted <laughs> the army. And now we have to go back. Now, if What's interesting is we have a lot of things in the New Testament about things that were lost. We have lost coins, lost sheep, lost everything. But one of the greatest things that are lost is us. And when we realize we're lost, we got to return ourselves to the owner. Now, in Deuteronomy 29, 19, it says it'll come to pass <clears throat> that there's going to be believers who hear the words of the curse and then he blesses himself and he says, I'm going to have peace even though I walk in the imagination of my own heart to add drunkenness to thirst. Well, look what it says in verse 20 and 21. The Lord won't spare that person, but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will be smoking against him. And then all the curses will lie upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven and the Lord will separate him unto evil out of all the tribes according to all the curses that are written in this book. That is pretty scary. And then we look at 24 through 28, once Israel's destroyed, as it was in 70 AD, it says, <clears throat> all the nations will come and say, why has the Lord done this? What does he mean by the heat of this great anger? And everyone's going to say it's because they forsaken the covenant that they had entered into. Okay. When he brought them out of land of Egypt, when they served other gods and worshiped them, gods they didn't even know and whom he had not given them, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in the book. And then it says the Lord did what? Rooted them out. It's one thing to cut the dandelions and they all grow back, but you got to what? Root them out. God rooted them out of the land. That is strong language in anger and in wrath and in great indignation. And then it says he cast them into another land as it is this day. There's an anomaly in Hebrew. You only see in Hebrew. You don't see this in your English Bible. But when it says he cast them, the Lamed is really big in the Torah scrolls. Well, if you remember, the Lamed represents a shepherd's staff. It represents authority, the shepherd. And they say the reason why it was real large was because even though he cast them out as the shepherd, he will take the shepherd's hook and he will gather them all back. That's very interesting uh, prophetically. And then look at this. 
this is one of my favorite verses, Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that he reveals to us and to our children forever reveal to us. Why? So that we may do all the words of the Torah. All right? This is why the Jewish people understand the secrets, and many of the Christians don't, because they don't want to do the words of the law. Now, what's fascinating, there's another anomaly in every Torah scroll, where it says unto us and to our children forever, it has all those little dots above it, and those aren't vowel sounds. This is just an anomaly that is uh, in every Torah scroll. And they, you know, and I think what some people say is that represents all the little children, you know, forever, generations. Now, look at this in Deuteronomy 31. It will be when all these things have come upon you, both the blessing and the curse <clears throat> that I've set before you, and when you shall call them to mind. Do you know what the Hebrew word for mind is here? Levav, which is also heart. The mind and the heart go together in Hebrew, all right? What's in your heart? What's in your mind? What are you thinking about? Now, if we look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 2, it says, and then when you call them to mind, okay, and you're going to return to the Lord. He's driven you to the other nations, and now you're going to return, and the Hebrew word is shuv, Okay, to the Lord your God, and you obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you, your sons, with all your heart, with all your soul. Okay, return or repent means to stand right next to him. Come right next to him. It says in verse 3 and 4 of Deuteronomy 30, then the Lord your God will turn your captivity. And it's the same word, shoo, you'll return from captivity. He'll have compassion on you. And then it says, he will return and gather you. That is Shuv. He returns. And I think it's fascinating that he is going to return. And he's returning very soon. And when he returns, he's going to gather them from all the nations that they've been scattered. This speaks, I believe, of his second return. And then in verse 5, it says, the Lord your God, he's going to bring you back to the land which your fathers possessed, and you're going to possess it. He'll do you good and multiply you. And then look at Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6. It says, the Lord your God is going to circumcise what? The Torah has always been about circumcision of the heart, not the flesh. It's the heart. The flesh is the earthly. The heart is the spiritual. And the heart of your seed and why does he circumcise our heart? It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. And then in Deuteronomy 30, verse 7 through 10, before I go there, I want to show you this. Here it says, your heart and the heart of your seed. God is going to circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. When does that circumcision take place? When is God going to circumcise the heart? Remember there's times and seasons, right? Are Christians supposed to know the times and seasons? Everyone says yes. And they ask the Christian, well, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. What season is it? Oh, I don't know. But they know we're supposed to know it. But they know they don't know it. I just don't understand why they don't want to know it. Well, the way you get to know it is by getting on God's calendar. The month of the lull, this is the very month God wants to circumcise your heart. That's why you return. God circumcises your heart and you whack the part of a gold sun. You go, wow, I need to go home. This month is the one month of the entire year when God is in the field, the king is in the field, and he's circumcising the hearts of those who want to have their heart circumcised. The words here in Hebrew are et lavavka, lavav, heart, your heart, and the et Lavav, the heart of your seed. Does everyone see that? Everyone following me? Okay. And it means return. We are in the month of what month? Elul, which is the month of return. 
which is when God circumcises our heart, so we will return. Now that is the English, let's do the Hebrew, and what do we see? Et lavav ka va et lavav, and the first letter of each word spells Elul. That is what it spells. This is the very month that God wants to circumcise hearts. Not any other month. This is the main, I mean, not that he won't, but this is when revival is going to begin to take place. I just thought that was fascinating. Let's see. Okay. Deuteronomy 37 through 10, it goes on and says, the Lord is going to put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. All right, now I'd rather that <laughs> than on me. Put it on the enemies. And it says, you will again obey the voice of the Lord. You're going to keep all of his commandments that I command you today. What? I thought they were all done away with. But this is saying 3,000 years from now, you're going to do the commandments that I'm commanding you 3,000 years ago. Well, how could they be done away with? It says, the Lord your God is going to make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your cattle, fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he took delight in your fathers, when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, his statutes that are written in the book of the law. And when? When you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's why he's got to circumcise the flesh off our heart. And then we find in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 16, he says, the commandment that I'm commanding you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. Remember Romans quotes this? It, the New Testament quotes this very verse. And it's not in heaven that you're supposed to say, well, who's going to send to heaven for us and bring it back that we can hear it and do it? It's not beyond the sea that you can say, well, who's going to go over the sea for us and bring it that we can hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is where? In your mouth and in your heart, which is why, again, pay the word for mouth is the year we're entering into. And I believe we're going to see big revival taking place because people will begin to confess the Messiah with their mouth. It's going to be a year of return. So you can do it. And then he says, I set before you today life of good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord that I command you today, and what's this big commandment? By loving the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his rules. Then you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God is going to bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. Now, here's something else. Let me see how much more I have and how much time I have. Woo! I've got, I've got way too much material. But this is important. How many believe God's cruel? Well, God commands you to fly. I command you to fly. Well, I can't fly, God. Matter of fact, I command you to fly, and if you don't, I'm sending you to hell. What kind of a God is that? Okay. God would never command us to do something if we weren't capable. It's that simple. God will not command you to do something. What if God said, I need you to repent of blue eyes? <laughs> How do I repent of blue eyes? Come on, I'll threaten you with hell if you don't. Okay, when people say I'm born sinful, they think that gives them excuse to sin. Well, I was born that way, God. What do you mean? How can you command me not to sin when you made me sinful? A lot of people's theology is screwed up, and especially in Christianity, you were never born sinful. Never. You were born broken. Sin is a transgression of the law. I did not commit a sin by being born. I had nothing to do with it. Okay? The problem is, much of Christianity, especially Catholicism, Baptists, and some of these, thinks you're born sinful. You're not born sinful. You're born broken. All right? You have a broken compass. You don't know where to go. You have a, a, a broken watch. You don't know what time it is. Now, when the time comes for you to make a choice, your tendency is going to make the wrong choice, but it's not a sin until you do. All right? 
You can't repent of physicality. Sin is a transgression of the law. It's not being born. And so uh, what we need to understand, the ultimate purpose for each and every one of the commandments is to bring us closer to God. That's the purpose. And we find that God created his word to help us in the journey. We know the Sabbath was made for us. We were not made for the Sabbath. All the commandments in the Torah, and this is so heavy. I want you to realize this. I want you to take this personally. You know, don't take it personally. Well, I'm telling you right now, take this personally. All the commandments in the Torah were tailored for you individually. As if you were the only one that was created, all these commandments were created for you. Now, God did not create us because he needed people to be put under his thumb and he needed things to get done. That's not why he created us. Do you, did you guys have your kids because you needed someone to take out the trash? Is that why you had kids? I I need someone to take out their trash. We have to totally rethink why God created us. The world, this world, was created to serve you. Think about it. God created everything to serve Adam and Eve. God is able, now this is the heaviest part of all, God is able to orchestrate all events on earth to deliver specifically to you an entirely customized set of experiences and choices for you to make. God has custom life, your life individually. Everyone's life he has totally customized individually. A set of experiences and choices for you to make. Despite the billions of the other people on earth today, he tailors your circumstances before you just as he did for Adam. No one has ever had, no one will ever have your life. This is simultaneously empowering and frightening. It's empowering because clearly we are critically important to God because he is orchestrating the universe to provide you as an individual with a customized set of choices that in their totality no one else will ever have. And frightening because it is as if the whole universe is depending upon you to make the right choices. You know, I mean, this is incredible. And this is why in Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20, he says, I'm calling heaven and earth to witness against you today. I set before you life and death. Please choose life. And in Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8, he tells everyone, be strong and of a good courage. And again, be strong and of a good courage. And then in Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 12, Moses says at the end of every seven years, in the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when everyone appears before the Lord your God, in the place he is the one to choose, you have to read this law before all of Israel, gather everyone, men, women, children, and the stranger, that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God to do all the words of this law. They didn't have printing presses. It takes a year to write one Torah scroll. And so most people back then had no idea what was in the Torah unless someone read it to them. This is why God said every seven years, I want everyone to at least be able to hear the main parts of this. And then in Deuteronomy 31, 17 through 19, God says, if they don't do this, my anger will be kindled against them. I will forsake them. And God says he will hide his face. That is scary with God where to hide his face. And then people are going to say all these evils have come upon us because our God is not among us. And then God says, I will surely hide my face because of all the evil they've done and they've turned to other gods. And then he says, now for, I want you to write a song. And I want you to teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness me against them forever. And so this is the song of Moses that the book of Revelation talks about. It is from this song. If we learn it, we'll know what they'll be singing. 
And then we see in Deuteronomy 31, 20 through 23, God says he brought them into the land that is flowing with milk and honey. They've eaten and now they're full and they've grown fat. And now they turn to other gods and they despise me. They break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles come on them, all of a sudden this strong song will confront them as a witness. For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I brought them into the land that I swore to them. And so Moses wrote the song the same day, taught it to the people of Israel, gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge, and he said, be strong and of a good courage. I don't know if you knew this, but I was in Israel visiting a school, and in the school, all the kids are singing, and they're all singing the Torah. They memorize it because it becomes a song. And we know once you sing a song, it's easier to memorize. That's how they can memorize the whole Torah. It all becomes a song. And then Deuteronomy 31, 28 through 30, Moses says, gather everybody together because I know that when I die, you will corrupt yourselves and all evil will befall you in the latter days he's talking about here. And then in bold it says, and Moses spoke in the ears of all the congregation of Israel, the words of this song until they were ended. And does anyone remember the name of that song? Ha'azinu, and that is a Torah portion coming near to you. And then the Haftar portion, I got a couple of verses here. Isaiah 61, look at the bold line there. It says, strangers are going to stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the alien are going to be your plowmen and your vine dressers. I think it's interesting, like how you'll veil. They're over there fulfilling these verses. How would you like to be a part of prophecy? Amazing. You can be a part of prophecy. And then Isaiah 61, 8, 9. The Lord says, I love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. Can you imagine? I, I want to give a burnt, uh, burnt offering to the Lord, so I'm going to steal my neighbor's sheep so I can go and offer it up to the Lord. Do you think he's going to accept that? I used to work in a Christian bookstore, and we'd have people coming in stealing Bibles all the time so they could give them away as gifts. I mean, I'm telling you, this was like 25 years ago. But yeah, people would steal Bibles all the time. Yeah. And then Isaiah 61, 8 and 9, I think this is interesting. It goes on and he says, I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And then it says their seed will be known among the Gentiles. Wow. He scattered them all among the Gentiles. And then it says, all that see them will acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. All the nations are going to realize the Jewish people are the ones the Lord has blessed. And then Isaiah 62, 10 through 12, it says, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the people. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your Yeshua is coming. Behold, his reward is with him. When it says his reward is with him, it's his reward he's going to give to his servants. And then it uh, says, and his work before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and they'll be called, sought out a city not forsaken. Well, let me tie this to the book of Revelation to a verse that is so misunderstood. Revelation 22, 12 is quoting that verse we just read. And it says, and behold, I come quickly. That's what it just said. My reward is with me. That's what it just said. To give every man according as his work shall be. It's not as his work shall be. It's as his work shall be. In other words, you, your reward is not based on on the work you do for God. Your reward is based on how much you allowed his work to be done through you. Your reward is not based on what you do for God. Your reward is based on how you allowed his work that he wanted done to be done through you. So we're not doing our work for God. This is his work, he told me to do for him. And he has asked each one of us to do a different work because he customized everything for you. The work 
His work through you is different than his work through you. And you're rewarded based on not what you do for God that you wanted to do. It's based on what you've allowed him to do that he wanted done through you. Pretty powerful, huh? Okay, well, let's stand then. Here we go. I'm sorry, I went a little over about six minutes, but. All right. Avinu Mokenu, a father of king. We just thank you so much that you make the Bible alive. It's your spirit that makes it alive. And I love it that your spirit wants to work through each and every one of us. It's so amazing to me that this entire world, even though everyone is in it, everyone experiences their own individual world. We all experience things differently, life differently. And you've tailored everything for us so that we can accomplish what you want to do through us. So, Father, I just thank you for all those that are here locally, around the United States, around the world, that wants to help take the light of your Torah, of your word, to all the nations of the world. What a blessing for those who tithe and give offerings, because it accomplishes your work, and we want to have your will be done here on earth, as it is in heaven. So we just thank you for all those who support your work through us. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, now we're back to the Song of Songs, where it's all about the month of Elul and returning to God as our king. We were in Acts 4, which is chapter 5, verse 3, through chapter 6, verse 10, where the bride finally experiences true repentance. She has a heartfelt church, a search. And look at Song of Songs 6 1. If you remember last week, she was imploring the daughters of Jerusalem to help them find her beloved. And then they say, Why in the world should we help you look for them? And then she goes through how fantastic and how phenomenal uh, he is. <clears throat> and then they say here, Where is your beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Where is your beloved turned aside? Because we want to seek him with you. And I was telling you last week, that's how we need to present the Lord. We need to present him in a way that people say, wow, I, well, let me find him. The, the most problem with evangelism, it's all hellfire and brimstone, you know, or legalism, or uh, it's, they look at your life and wondering, what in the world is he going to do for me? So uh, we need to realize how we present the Lord is one of the most important things. And so... Look how she responds when they also want to look for the shepherd in verse 2 and 3. Now, this is uh, so important. She says, my beloved has gone into his garden. Okay, it's not my garden anymore. It's his garden to the beds of spices. And then she says, it's to feed his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. Okay, I've got a bunch of lilies here. Now, if you remember, lilies speak of people. All right, as you know, we can be referred to as sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. Okay, we're compared to sheep. We can be compared to goats. We can uh, be compared to lilies. All right, so God uses all kinds of metaphors. And in here, it refers to souls. He's gathering lilies. And so what do we see? Now look at this. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock, where? Among the lilies. Uh, there's so much that's in these verses here. Uh, like I said, it's no longer my garden. It's now his garden. But what you're going to see here is the Shulamite is maturing 
in her relationship. How many of you know it's all about relationship? Okay, she's maturing in her relationship with the shepherd. Uh, we realize, or she realizes, it's his garden, it's his flock. And so throughout scriptures, God's people are related to as all kinds of things. Remember bringing in the sheaves? Look at Psalm 126, 6. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And we know uh, even from Joseph's dream, the sheaves refer to people. Now, do you remember in chapter 2, verse 16, she goes, my beloved is mine and I am his. But now it's turned around. It's I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So her claim on him now comes second. It's not he belongs to me first and then I'm his. But no, now I'm his and he is mine. Well, you're going to find it changes again as she matures even more. When it talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, many Christians think that means the last one billionth Gentile or something like that. No, the fullness of the Gentiles means the maturity of the Gentiles. You don't reap a crop until it's mature. And so God is waiting for the church to grow up. That's what he's waiting for. Now, let's see. Now look at how the shepherd responds. In chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, let me, I want to make sure I'm not skipping anything. Okay, he says, oh my love, you are as beautiful as what? Okay, who's ever heard of Terza? Okay, well, I'm going to explain Terza here in just a minute when he says you are as beautiful as Terza. Then he says, as lovely as Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then look at this. Awesome as an army with banners. That's what she says. She alone is like an army with banners. They used to always have banners, the military did. People would see the banners. And the word means to be conspicuous. You want everybody to see, which is why when the Lord comes, he's going to have all of the tribes of Israel with them, and they all are going to have their banners as they come. And then the shepherd says to her, oh, turn your eyes away from me. They've overcome me. Now he describes her again. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing, everyone bearing twins. None is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veils. Okay, now watch this. He says to her, now do you remember there's Jerusalem and then there's the daughters of Jerusalem. Who does Solomon love? The daughters of Jerusalem. He doesn't care about Jerusalem. Look what this says. The shepherd is saying to his bride, look, there's 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number, my dove, my perfect one. You are the only one. You are the only one of her mother. So he's not consumed with all the daughters of Jerusalem. He loves Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting. The only one of her mother. That's very significant. And I'll show you why here in a minute. Then the favorite of the one who bore her. Do you remember when God told Abraham to offer up Isaac? <clears throat> he said, offer up your son. Goes, Which one? Your only son. Which one? <laughs> you know, the one you love. Oh, that one. <laughs> well, that's kind of what is going on here as well. And then it says, <clears throat> the daughter saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Well, we have to realize there's a heavenly Jerusalem as well as an earthly Jerusalem. And in one sense, uh, God is speaking of two armies. He has his earthly army and he has his heavenly army. And so just like people are 
born on earth, there are people who are born again. And the ones who are born again, their birth is heaven. Are you following me? There's a earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem that's coming down. And when it comes down, there are all of those who were born there are the ones who are going to live there because they've been born again. Look at Psalm 87, 5 and 6. And of Zion, it will be said, well, this and that person was born in her and the highest himself will establish her. The Lord will count when he writes up the people. This is the one who was born there. That's referring to those who are born again, the who are born from above. Now, who was Terza? Look at this, back in the Torah, Numbers 27, 1 through 5, here comes the daughters of Zelophehad and the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, Machar, the son of Manasseh, families of Manasseh, son of Joseph. And look at the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and... Oh, so she was one of those daughters that said, hey, my dad doesn't have a son, can't we have the land, Right? So she was one of those daughters that fought for the land of Israel. That's what she wanted. Now, it's interesting. The tribe of Manasseh, they were on the one side of Jordan and the other side of Jordan. Their tribes were split. And they want to make sure they have their side in the promised land, not on the other side of Jordan. And it says they stood before Moses and Eliezer, the priest, and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle back of the congregation saying, look, our father died in the wilderness. He wasn't in the company of those that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah. Yeah, he may have died in his own sin and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? Because he doesn't have a son. Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses said, well, let me go check it out. Let me see what the Lord says. Terza, her name means delightful. That's what Terza means. There was actually a city that was named after her that was just north of Shechem or Shechem in the promised land. Okay, we see that she, that their dad was the offspring of Manasseh and uh, they go to find out what's going to happen. But look at 1 Kings 15, 33 in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahiah, to reign over all of Israel. Where? Terza's where all the kings of Israel reigned. So Terza's huge. And here he reigned 24 years. So Terza was the capital of the northern tribes. This is where all the kings reigned. Now, like I said, I can't help but think of all the wives that Solomon had. As I read the phrase, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. And then I think it's exciting that the shepherd says, you are the one and the only one for me. Solomon was never satisfied. But what do we read concerning the Lord in Jerusalem? In Psalm 137, 5 and 6, it says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my what? Chief joy. Solomon is not happy with Jerusalem. She's not her chief, his chief joy. His chief joy is in all the daughters of Jerusalem. I also find it interesting, as I mentioned, that she's called the only one of her mother, Oh, we saw Terza had all kinds of sisters. There was a whole bunch of sisters. He's talking about Terza, and then he goes and says the only one of her mother. Well, we also, like I said, remember what the Lord said to Abraham concerning Isaac. Uh, we see it in Genesis 22, 2, when he said, take now your son. And he's thinking, well, I got two sons. And he says, your only son. Oh, well, I, I still only have two sons. The one you love, even Isaac. Well, in Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 10, look at this. She looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. 
And I think it's interesting. It mentions an army with banners and it mentions the moon and the sun. Okay, which is, you know, I keep thinking also in terms of eclipses when they're happening. But look at this. This is another thing that is totally amazing. Now, here we see the Shulamite, the bride, is described as an army with her flags flying high for all the world to see with clarity. There's no longer any doubt on her part as to her identity or her relationship with the shepherd. And uh, we'll be talking more about the warrior bride later. But that word uh, means dagal, which means to flaunt, to raise a flag, to be conspicuous. So like Esther, she didn't want to be conspicuous. She wanted to hide her identity. Well, there's a time coming when the church, the bride, believers aren't going to be afraid to show they're a believer. They're going to be flying the flag of God without fear. They're going to be part of the army and they're going to be conspicuous. A lot of times during the tribulation, you think, oh, everybody's going to be afraid hiding behind a rock. No, we need to flaunt the flag. As a matter of fact, if we realize this, what the Song of Songs is saying is the bride is now sanctified. She's become a mighty warrior. She's now ready for battle. She's rejoicing in her shepherd king. Look at Isaiah. It speaks about this day. It says the burden against Babylon. Now, think when you think of Babylon, also think of the book of Revelation and mystery Babylon. He says, lift up a banner on the highest mountain. So here you're on a high mountain lifting up a banner. Everyone's going to see it. And then it says, raise your voice to them and wave your hand like, yee I'm over here. Try to come and get me. We're not to be afraid. And it says that they may enter the gates of the nobles. He says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I've also called my mighty ones. Why? For my anger, <clears throat> those who rejoice in my exaltation. Here's the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like that of many people, a tumultuous noise of kingdoms of nations all gathering together. And the Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. So God is mustering the army for battle. Are we going to be deserters? Or are we going to be afraid of the giants? Or are we going to join the battle? They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. Well, here it is. The day of the Lord is at hand. That's the tribulation. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold, sorrows will take hold of them. They'll be in pain as a woman in childbirth. How many of you know from Matthew 24 and everywhere, this is it's talking about the day of the Lord here. And it says they will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. But now look at the next verses. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He's going to destroy the sinners out of it. And then look at here, we have the sun, the moon, and the stars of Genesis 1.14, all involved. The stars of heaven and the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and is going forth. The moon will not cause her light to shine. I will punish the world for their evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Well, if you remember in Joseph's dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars representing Jacob, Israel, okay? And the 12 stars, okay? The moon. So all of this represented the nation of Israel, but also all the believers. Look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Here we find the earth was without form, void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moves on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. There's so much in these verses people don't realize. It says, God said, let there be light. Many believe 
he didn't say, let there be light. He sang, let there be light. Okay, I mean, I, can you imagine the power of God singing, let there be light? I mean, God is, how, wow, the voice of the Lord is powerful. And so that's one thing I want to point out. I believe at creation, he sang it. Wouldn't that just be mind-blowing? But here's the other thing. The Hebrew word for to speak or to say is amor. Uh, Aleph, mem, resh, amor. Now, get a load of this. Um, let me see. And, and as I mentioned, Israel was compared to the sun, the moon, and the stars because they were foreordained to be the light to the world. That's why they're compared to that. In Genesis uh, 15, 5, it says, and he brought Abraham abroad and said, look now toward heaven and do what? Count the stars. If you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your seed be. So all of Abraham's faithful descendants were all to be as signs. The stars were to be signs. And if we're to be as that in heavens as signs, it says, so shall your seed be. His seed is supposed to be light in the darkness. We're to be the light in the dark world. Now, I always thought this was fascinating. This is Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. Those that are wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament. Those that turn many to righteousness will be as the stars forever and ever. But you, O Daniel, set up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end, and many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Now, if you know anything about astronomy, there's real bright stars and there's dim stars. Some of them are because they're further away. Some of them is because they are so much bigger than the other ones. But I take this literally as well. Each one of you, as a believer, are going to be a, like a star. You're going to have brightness. But depending, every one of us will be a different size star. We will all have different magnitude. Okay, so we have to understand that God is not a socialist. God is not a communist. It, it, everybody doesn't get an A just for appearing. Okay, and so we have to realize, what magnification do you want to be? Do you want to be a, I mean, you're all going to be a star. You're all going to glow. But at what magnification do you want to be? What size? The bigger you are, the more glory goes to God. It's not for you. Again, when you think about, I want to be a big star, it's not for you. How much do you want God to be magnified? That's the question. It's not how big do you want to be. It's how much glory do you want to give to God? That really turns things around. And look at Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise and shine for your light has come. It's the glory of the Lord that's risen upon you. That, he's the light. Darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness the people. One of these darkness means moral darkness. Okay, you got to think of that as well. And then it says, but the Lord is going to rise on you. His glory, and it's not your glory, it's his glory that's going to be seen on you. He's speaking to Israel. And he says, the Gentiles are going to come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising, just like the rising of the sun. So Jacob, or Israel, if you remember, is the sun. Rachel was the moon. And Joseph and his brothers were the stars. Israel is going to be coming such a huge, bright star that everyone's going to recognize. Now, here's something else that I always thought was interesting. In Genesis 15, 12 through 16, the sun is going down. 
a deep sleep falls on Abram and a horror of great darkness falls upon him. And the Lord says to Abram, do you, you need to know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that isn't theirs and shall serve them and afflict them 400 years. And that nation whom they serve, I will judge. Then they'll come out with great substance and you shall go to your fathers in peace and will be buried in a good old age. And then it says in the fourth generation, you will come here again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet. Full. So what do we see? Redemption comes when the iniquity of the Amorites is full. When does redemption come? When the iniquity of the Amorites is full. What does the Hebrew word Amorite mean? No, no, no. Now, you, we have uh, um, Hamas is violence, okay, and the Hittites are the terrorists, and Amalek is the people who chop up bodies. But the Amorites, God was waiting for the iniquity of the Amorites to come to the full. Do you know it is now that the iniquity of the Amorites has come to the full, and redemption is about to take place? Who do who does represent the Amorite today? You have to know what the word Amorite means. The Amorite actually is spelled Amor with a U. And Amor means to speak. The Amorites are the fake news. It's the publicists. It's the press. And the iniquity of the press is at the fullest it's ever been with all the fake news. Isn't that mind-blowing? He's talking about those who speak, the publicist, to be prominent. Evil speech, those who always are doing evil speech. Evil speech is at its highest point today. Look at all the evil speech among the religions, the politicians, the everything. And so when the iniquity of the press has come to the full... Redemption is nigh. Isn't that fascinating? Now, speaking of the Song of Songs and lifting up the banner, and there's armies, it has to do with armies, and even mentioned, I think next week we'll talk about two armies, just like remember when Jacob, when he called uh, the place that means two armies, okay, Manahaim, here you have God's army in heaven and Israel was God's army on earth. Well, look at Numbers 10, 13, and 14. Here, they're taking their very first journey after being a year around Mount Sinai. They got a year off. That probably was the Shemitah year. I'd have to look. But what do we see? They're going according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And you have to realize they're going to battle. They're going with Joshua to take the promised land. And it says, In the first place of the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, set forward according to their army, and over his army was not shown the son of Amminadab. So what tribe marched first? And who was the head of it? Not shown. And why was not shown the head of it. He was the first one to jump into the Red Sea that caused it to divide. That's why he got to go first. Now, again, they are entering the promised land in the order of how they journeyed. And so what do we see now? Let's see. In Numbers 10, when they go to March, when we go to verse 35 and 36, whenever they set out, this is what Moses said. And they're just now setting out as their armies to take the promised land. Moses would say, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he said, 
Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Did you know there is something very weird about this verse in the Bible, in Hebrew, that you don't see in English? Does anyone remember? It's surrounded by two dead fish. There are two dead fish. Now, the Hebrew letter for fish is the letter noon. And the letter noon, just like we put parentheses around something, these are like brackets, okay? But the letter noon are backwards and upside down. And the sages have always wondered why in the world this verse is separated from all the rest of the Torah. As a matter of fact, they thought that should be the six books of the Torah, just that one verse. Well, what is amazing, what believers in Yeshua have come to realize, when it says, rise up, O Lord, that refers to his resurrection 2,000 years ago. And upon his return, it represents the resurrection of the dead when all of us also rise. Now, look at this. Here I have a compass. We have north, south, west, and east. And I want to point out to you, think of Moses' tabernacle in the middle there. East went first when they're going to war. Then south, then west, and then north. They all, you know, going around the clock or the compass. Now, who went first on the east? Exactly, it was Judah. Now, on the south, you have three tribes on the east. You have three tribes on the south, three on the west, three on the north. That equals 12 tribes, okay? Now, who was in charge of the south? Judah was in charge, but Issachar and Zebulun are also over there. Okay, who was in charge of the south? What tribe? Reuben. Exactly. Now, Reuben had a tribe on either side of them. And what I want you to realize, the three tribes here and here all were Leah's kids. Rachel's kids were west and north. All right? Now, you have Zilpa, Leah's handmaid, Zilpa. Okay, her kids are over here. And the last one on the south is Gad. All right. Then, so I want you to think of Leah. The baton that's being passed is going all the way around and then ends up with Gad. Gad then gives it to the head over here. Now, who was that? Who was the head on the west? Ephraim. All right. And then Benjamin and Manasseh were also over there. But so then it goes from Gad, Judah, the baton is passing around every tribe to Gad. And then Gad hands it off to Ephraim. And then all the tribes follow until it ends up with Naphtali. Okay, so I want you to think as the sun, as Rachel and Leah, the moons, as Bilhah and Zilpah, her two handmaids. Everyone following me? So the baton passes to, from Leah's side to Rachel's side, over to the last one on Rachel's side, and then back to Judah. Now, this is how they marched to war. You following me? Judah would go first. Zebulun, Issachar, come down here. You'd have Reuben, all right? Then you'd have Simeon, and then you'd have Gad. And then they'd go from Ephraim to Benjamin and Manasseh, okay? And, and then it would go to the north. Who was in charge of the north? Dan. Dan. Okay, Here's what is so mind-blowing. I hope this helped people get this. The eclipses that are coming are right here. <clears throat> a 
solar eclipse always for the last, since creation, has always followed a lunar eclipse by two weeks. You see, March 14th, March 29th, September 7th, September 21st, you know, September 18th, October 2nd. We just had the lunar eclipse on September 18th. Rosh Hashanah is October 2nd. What I want you to notice here, let me do this. Okay, Judah went first, right? And that is the solar eclipse, the big solar eclipse that went across the United States. Now, solar eclipses refer to the nations, lunar eclipses to Israel. And that was followed by this last September 18th, a lunar eclipse. And it went from Judah to Gad. And then we find Tishri 1, Ephraim in the west, and it ends up with Naphtali in the north. The eclipses are happening in the same order as how they march to war to take the promised land. And it happens two years in a row. And they're happening on Nisan 1, Tishri 1. A low 15 and Purim, a dar 15. Purim is all about Amalek wanting to destroy Israel. These, this is why I wrote my book, America at War 24 through 26, because I understand God said in Genesis 114, the sun and the moon are signs on the appointed times, which is Nisan 1, Tishri 1, a low 15, a dar 15. And here these are plainly put in order of how it's going to appear over the next two years. This is why we have to understand, like the Song of Songs talks about, an army with banners, clear as the sun, fair as the moon. This is telling us this is why war is going to be coming big time over these next two years. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we're at Act 5, which begins... Chapter 6, verse 11 through 8, 4. And here the bride finally works the harvest. This time she falls asleep, not because of lethargy, but because she's been working so hard. And so look what we find in the Song of Songs, chapter 6, 11 and 12. What does the bride say? I went down into the garden. Wow. Remember, she's always been in bed, doesn't want to go out. Here she voluntarily goes down into the garden of nuts, that's California, I'm kidding, okay, <laughs> to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished. In the second chapter, Messiah says we've got to take care of the vine. The foxes are spoiling the vine, which refers to the false prophets we saw. And she could care less. But now she's going to see if the vine is flourishing, whether the pomegranates budded. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. She's running, just like uh, Abraham. He would always run. To everything he did, he would run. His heart was in it. And so how do the daughters of Jerusalem respond when she, they see her on the run for her beloved? They go, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And that speaks of the month of Belul. And look at this. How does she respond? What in the world are you going to see in me? So now she's humble. It's not about her. She says, why do you want to look at me? And look how they respond. What do I see? I see the company of what? Two armies. It's the heavenly army and the earthly army. They, they finally see it. And look at Genesis 32, 1 and 2. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's army. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means two camps, two armies. So here he had his army on earth, and the army of heaven was around him. And then look at 1 
Chronicles chapter 14, verse 13 and 15. The Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. Therefore, David inquired again of God and God said to him, don't go up after them. Turn away from them. Come upon them against the mulberry trees. And it will be when you hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle for God has gone forth before you to smite the host of the Philistines. There are two armies and we have to go when God says go. The spies decided to go the following day and Moses says, don't go. He's not with you. But they also did the opposite of what God said then. We have to be in shape. We have to be ready to go to war. We can't be afraid like the 10 spies. But we have to understand this war, spiritual, physical, go hand in hand. And that's what we're entering. All right. But don't be afraid. With that, let's stand.